That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Naked Singularity, the directorial debut of Chase Palmer, which Screen Media Films uh, is releasing theatrically August 6th, 2021, uh, followed swiftly by a video on demand release of August 13th, 2021. Oh, for some reason I thought this was a Netflix movie. <laughs> no, that's the John David Washington we still have to watch. Oh, which I'm more excited about. You are? I was excited about this film because of the trailer. Yeah, it did have a well-cut trailer. It's based on a book. Yes, by Sergio de la Pava. Unfortunately, this movie was all over the place. There is, there's so much going on, and most of it is half-baked. I think, so I haven't read the book. From what I understand, it's kind of a stream-of-consciousness style, uh, which is probably why the, the narrative is so bonkers, because in the... Uh, a style like that, they would be able to pull that off. Uh, but all of the uh, ideas here, including the the quantum physics, I guess, uh, feel like they're not well attenuated. My very first note is I don't understand what's happening. Yeah, you did make that comment very early on. Yeah. Uh, but, okay, so the director? Chase Palmer. So it, uh, this, what he adapted Stephen King's It, at least the part one for the 2017 reboot by okay. Andreas Muschietti, uh, which also explains why Bill Sarsgaard is on here. Uh, so this is his directorial debut, but notably it was uh, executive produced by Anna Bowden and Ryan Fleck, uh, notable directors themselves, and Ridley Scott. Oh. Uh, and I will say, to start off on a positive note, I did like the poster art for this film. Oh, I don't know what it looks like. Okay, okay the basic story revolves around a character named Cassie? Yes. Played by Daniel Boyega. No? John Boyega. John Boyega. Were you saying you were confusing him for Daniel Kaluuya? No. But. <laughs> John Boyega. John Boyega. Who you have seen. I know you saw at least the first Star Wars reboot, which you probably have no memory of. No. Anyway, he's a public defender. And he's sort of painted early on as like sort of a hothead who is frustrated with the criminal justice system as it pertains to um, defendants being treated unfairly. Which we'll get into because that doesn't quite work for me, how it's presented. When he, I mean, the for his, uh, all over the places this movie is, the story's quite simple. He's a public defender who's kind of frustrated with the system. He gets an opportunity to get in on a heist to steal $30 million worth of heroin. Mm -hmm. So he would get half. And he chooses to do so with the thought that he could use that money to help people. So he executes the heist, gets his $15 million worth of heroin, and the end of the film is him... Now, because he was suspended, like his uh, license as a lawyer like was suspended. For six months. For six months. So he comes back and he's no longer working for, he's no longer a public defender. He's working privately. We assume he's doing pro bono work and we see him uh, in a courthouse working on a trial for this young man who he believes was falsely arrested and he offers to pay his bail while he works on the case because now he has money. The end. Yeah. That's it. Sure. Yeah. Those are the the fine the finer points of the plot mechanisms. But Could, I, I think it seems confusing because there there is this um, notion of uh, the bindings of the universe. Uh, coming undone because there's a countdown of like 12 days to collapse eight days to collapse which kinds of kind of leads us to think based on one scene where uh tim blake nelson uh who's a physicist that likes to smoke weed starts uh, who's uh cassie's neighbor or friend friend, friend who, so yeah who's talking about how space and time are coming undone so it, it leads us to kind of falsely believe that there's going to be some kind of black hole of happening, happening yeah. as well uh, because naked singularity is a uh, reference to th th this term in physics gravitational singularity which you know google it and see if you think that makes any sense to what's going on here but yeah. um, I, I, don't, I didn't think so could I go through my notes really quickly does Boyega generally do like is he known for sort of being Denzel-esque I don't think so because in this movie I was getting Denzel Washington down and it was very distracting 
and which it's funny you say that because you haven't seen Roman J. Israel uh, from a couple years ago, which is this film most closely mimics with Denzel playing, which he was Oscar nominated for playing a public defender who uh, his insistence at railing against the criminal justice system is at the uh, expense of his clients who he's not making the best choices for. Um, but no, I, I think Boyega strangely is more denzel -y than John David Washington feels on screen overall. Uh, but no, I don't think that he tends, it tends, I don't tend to have that thought about him. Okay, so the character Cassie was very frustrating because from the trailer, I thought that he was sort of this like activist attorney, like he went into it to try to help people. But he really just comes across as a hothead. And I think your favorite character in the film is the the judge. Played by Linda Lavin. Do you know who that is? I recognize her from something. Uh, she's probably best known still for Alice. The That's right. That's how I know who she is. So um, this judge is, you know, she's a tough one. I don't think she's out of bounds. No, but it's funny how it becomes a game because how she responds to him is also compromising the the human behind him as well but because she but that's partially she, i think it's partially cassie's fault though it is but she does double down on him to prove a point to the lawyer which is at the expense still of this client but which she might not have done if he wasn't pushing her you're right but i think isn't it an attorney's job especially a public defender who is i'm very i'm sure very familiar with the judges that they work with like it's a game, and he needs to show respect to the courtroom and play the game so he can get optimal results for his client. But instead, he's just, he's like a loose cannon. He can't help himself from being, I mean, he's found in contempt, which is why he ends up at risk of being disbarred, but his superior chooses to just suspend him for six months. But I was very frustrated with that character because he didn't, he didn't read as someone who is really trying to help others. I think he was more consumed with his ego, which could be a very inter like in the book, maybe that is the thing. And I think it is also an interesting character trait. Just in this film, it's like blurred between the two and they don't match. Like, like those two characteristics don't go together. Right. And I think that there's another component that had this film, you know, uh, done a better job of characterization, kind of teased out that intersection of this is also a female judge. And the response to somebody combating her or probably what she's used to from, you know, having power over men, per se, uh, in a way that men don't react very well to, I, I think is a way to read his behavior with her as well. Right. Another thing I found really distracting is the character of Cassie is made to look so disheveled. Yes, he is. Because, like, he's so committed to his job, he doesn't sleep or kind of take care of himself. But it's too literal, like... It is, because... We, we, we don't really see him, like, what do they say, sweat the midnight or burn the midnight yeah, we oil? Don't, we, don't. we don't see that. We just see him looking kind of a wreck, mm -hmm. which really just means his hair needs to be shaped a little better and his shirt is kind of untucked. Not wrinkled, just untucked. Um, okay, you really liked the judge. I really liked Bill Skarsgård. He's super cute in this movie. His character is cute, but it doesn't match the story or the tone because he's kind of comedic. Yes. And yeah, he's or not humorous, humorous. He's not bad playing Day and another public defender that John Boyega brings into um, this heist uh, involving Leah. Uh, yeah, it, it, it just, it increasingly, especially the dialogue, I think, takes, if it's not great throughout, but it really takes a turn for the worse. Uh, in the final throes of the film and the way people are speaking and it's just it, it it's written as from almost like a pretentious standpoint of people that are trying to be too cool and then because of that distracts us from not being very well detailed on any other front about how an impound lot works and etc yeah that's my next note this dialogue oh my gosh i feel like you know if so, like if someone told me you have to write like your version of Inception, I would come up with this bullshit. Like it just, like you said, it's like the dialogue's trying to seem like witty and smart, but at the expense of like actually explaining aspects of the, to, to the story that aren't making sense to me. Namely, so one major thing that I didn't explain in the story is the reason Cassie gets, 
intertwined into all this is there is a woman named Leah who works at an impound lot. Played by Olivia Cook. And she's approached by a man named Craig, a very handsome man. Ed Screen. And Leah's a very beautiful woman. And he's sort of hitting on her and he's trying to bribe her to let him take a car that's been impounded. But he doesn't have the proper um, documentation. So she rebuffs him. But then she sees him on like Tinder or something and agrees to meet him for sex. So they hook up. He immediately seems crazy, so she pulls a gun on him and says, get out. And the next thing we know, she's been arrested for heroin possession. So then it's like, okay, how'd this happen? And the story does kind of explain that he asked her to get some heroin out of... The reason he's trying to get this car out of the impound lot is that there is $30 million worth of heroin sewn into like the upholstery. So she goes to get a sample of it and she gets caught. But that is not really explained. And then we find out that Dane, Bill Skarsgård's character, who's Cassie's buddy and fellow DA or a public defender, he approaches Cassie and says, hey, this lady with beautiful ears, she really wants you to help her on this case. And I don't want to do it, so can you do it? I thought that whole transition was real crunchy. It's real rough because it, it's it's not really streamlined, maybe not very good storytelling, at, at, at least uh, laid out here, where I think probably in text it works a lot better. But, sure. but yes, as it adapted this way in this film version, it, it really just doesn't work because you're so distracted about so many things um, and not in a good way. Um, so then, so there's this sort of like supernatural metaphysical component to the story. Then it's like sort of like a courtroom drama. Then it's also like a, a thriller slash heist film. Love story. Then it, there's a love story because Leah and Cassie end up having sex. And it would seem that they are like a thing. But I don't know where that comes from. The only thing the audience is told is that he worked on a case with her previously. And he likes her. Right, but it's like, okay, so they have sex. That doesn't go well because she feels like... Well, because he confronts her about what she's trying to do, which is steal this heroin. And then, so then they go through this ordeal where they do the heist, which we'll get to, and they are successful. But then the end of the film, um, before we flash forward to him helping this young man, Cassie... Is the three of the three of them, Cassie, Dane, and Leah, parting ways? So then they, so their relationship really isn't right. Anything. It, it made me think. I had read before we watched this. Somebody's comparing it to Roman J. Israel meets Donnie Darko, which I don't quite agree with because it doesn't veer enough into the physics um, subtext, at least in the film. No. Uh, I, I'd say it's more like uh, Roman J. Israel meets Quick Change, starring Bill Murray. Who's Angus? Is that the 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 physics guy? Angus, what what's your note? He says so. Oh Ca yes, that's Tim Blake Nelson playing. Yes, Angus, okay. Right? So Cassie, so uh, Dane is trying to convince Cassie like, let's do this heist. We can get this money. Let's think of all the good we can do. We deserve it. <clears throat> and Cassie's like, no, it's wrong. And then he talks to his little physics friend Angus, and Angus tells him, um, one can break the law and still believe in justice deep that's deep and then cassie's like yeah i'm gonna do it mm -hmm. oh what that's all it took i was going more often to after this film like trying to look up singularities and what's a naked singularity and like singularity in regards to a black hole is the density becomes infinite at the center of the black hole and i don't know if that was kind of like the structure of how the film, i'm reading too far into it i'm sure but uh or maybe the naked well the filmmakers are probably glad you're doing that or the <laughs> naked singularity is like sam fuller's naked kiss and there's this weird perverted pedophile kind of I um, really felt disconnected from the character Cassie making the decision to steal $30 million worth of heroin from the Mexican drug cartel. That is... Like, I just didn't understand that, that, where he is in his life. He doesn't seem to be hurting financially. He doesn't seem... He, he's just a hothead who's trying to do the right thing, I think. I mean, these people haven't seen Sicario, apparently, because uh, if... I was dealing with the Mexican drug cartel. I wouldn't want to let them know where I work or see my face. So the Ed Screen and Olivia Cook characters, like, do you think these men, just because you get away in this car, are not going to find you? Uh, well, 
I don't know. Just it it the Let's talk about the actual heist because that shit looks so amateur. It looks so amateur. So first of all, the whole thing's so what so what's happening is are you gonna get up and grab her? No. No. Oh. The whole thing the cat's being disruptive. She's opening and closing doors. Um the thirty million dollars worth of heroin in this Lincoln Navigator which has been impounded, the plan is that vehicle is going up for auction because no one has claimed it. So uh, Cassie and Dane plan on getting the car before the cartel does. Mm -hmm. But that kind of gets screwed up because the dates get mixed up or something like that. She so lied. Libby Cook lied. She lies, lies, but then all of them, all of part, all of the parties involved converge on that auction at the same time. So they're all there bidding and the cartel wins the bid. They bid 60 grand for this navigator and Craig, the guy, can't do it because he doesn't have enough money. So there's this thing where like she tricks the cartel guy to like wait while she gets the vehicle to her person so they can steal it. And like you said, they, it's like, is she not considering the fact that the cartel is going to find her? They know where she works. They know exactly who duped them. And she also had to leave her shift at work to do she, And then she just leaves her job, so everyone's going to know who's responsible. Then, that little chase scene, I wrote down, my quote is, this old Nickelodeon-ass chase scene. Which is funny, because they try, <laughs> with the editing and the uh, changing of the frames, the swiping, they're trying to make that have an energy that it doesn't. It literally, like, I'm going to enter, so I'm going to pull surveillance footage from our driveway, and you're going to see me back out of the driveway and drive down the street. That's about as tense as... <laughs> the scene of them getting away was. I thought that was so crunchy. Then, because Craig, the guy who she's sort of been in cahoots with, she's like double-crossing him. So he doesn't know that Cassie and Dane are going to show up and steal the drugs. So they get to some warehouse. Cassie and Dane end up killing everyone involved. Yes, because it was her plan to uh, sell these goods to this Brooklyn uh, crime syndicate that's run by a bunch of Hasidic Jews. Oh, that's right. That's I forgot about the Hasidic Jews. Yeah. They're the one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I don't understand how they are going to offload the heroin because they killed all the Jewish people. They did, yeah. So they're not getting the money from them. And then we see them walk away with, like each... Cassie and Dane each have like their duffel bag filled with I'm assuming heroin because 15 million wouldn't fit in the duffel bag because Floyd Mayweather carries around a million dollars all the time and it fits in one backpack so it wouldn't 15 million wouldn't fit in the duffel bag so it's heroin so how are these like two public defenders who have killed a number of people and it seems like that'd be very traceable. They were at the auction. Like, the, the story just seems so flimsy to me that I was very Well, even, even in the impound lot when John Boyega is creeping around, and it does show that there's some cameras there, and he just kind of disconnects one. It's like, whoa. The scene before they even go um, into... So the scene before they go into the warehouse where the Jewish men are, Dane and... Cassie have like this pep talk where he pulls out like a machine gun and a gas mask, but then really it's not a machine gun. It's like shooting like noxious gas or whatever. But I thought that played out so like that tone it was bad. of like Dane being kind of funny, which I thought he Bill Sarsgaard is really cute in this role, but it does not fit this movie. I know, and I think poor John Boy I guess to say something like, that's a fuck ton of a gun and uh, and then there's, there's another line, but Bill Sarsgaard has a line about, don't talk to me like I'm a dilettante. <laughs> yes. Anyway, my last note, just a little gripe, because I also fixate on, I fixate on hair and cars, because yep. I know both of those really well. The Navigator they're driving, they say it's a 2015, but it's a 2018, and shit like that bothers me. Anyway, what else you got? It looks fine. Uh, cinematographer Andrzej uh, Perek, who has worked for Anna Fleck and Ryan Bowden on several productions. I thought it looked fine. It I, did. I liked the scene, I liked how the scene looked where they were in the club and they're in that mm -hmm. kind of neon lit uh, tunnel, yeah. if you will. It did look good. It's trying to show Bill Skarsgård as this, Skarsgård as this cocaine partier. Uh, yeah, it, it looked fine. I, it, I already knew that it kind of, because this opened at the San Francisco Film Festival. So, uh, but based on the reception it had and how it was being described, I'm like, oh, I bet there's something here that I'll like, though. 
Like it sounds like it's going out on a limb in, in an interesting way. And unfortunately, I <laughs> didn't think that at all. At the bare minimum, I feel, I mean, it's not, you know, it wouldn't have been true to the source material, but I think an easy story to tell is like a public defender who's frustrated with the system because he wants to help people and he involves himself in some sort of criminal activity to fund him helping people. I think that could have been very interesting. But as it is, there's too much going on. Well, the thing about adaptation is you have the power, you know, to... Uh, take or leave what you want from it. The, the metaphysical component of this story is so, like, anemic that it just is like, are you just trying to, like, gaslight us with this whole, like you said, 12 days to collapse, 8 days to collapse? I really thought there was going to be, like, an extinction-level event or something. Or, yeah, there's a wormhole opening something. up. Something. And it's like, no, it's just the countdown to the heist, and really that physicist is just talking out the side of his ass. Let the, let the movie tell it. But then maybe in the book, who knows? What would you give this thing? One and a half. I would give it one and a half out of five as well. Thank you. Bye.